um, drawing out what we can learn from their end of life. When they got to the end of their lives, where were they at? How did they get there? What had they learned along the way? And what can we learn from that? So just to set up the history of Israel at this time, um, we have Abraham who was called by God to father the nation of Israel. And so he had Isaac and Jacob and then Joseph and then they went to Egypt and then Moses was called by God to lead them back from Egypt back into the promised land and then Joshua actually led that conquest back into the promised land that's what we talked about last Sunday and Israel settled in the land now at this time in history there's no king there's no ruler over Israel God was supposed to be their king that's the way he designed it Uh, but the people over time began to turn away from God They began to worship the false gods of the Canaanites and other pagan nations that surrounded them. And it says in Judges chapter 2, verses 11 to 12, it says, The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. That's the false gods. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. So this was a pattern that was taking place at this time. It's called the period of the Judges. Israel would sin against God, They would turn their back on God and then so God would then remove his blessing and protection on them and the surrounding nations would attack them and conquer them and then God would raise up leaders from amongst the nation that were known as judges. These were men and women who in some cases were heroes that God used to save Israel from her enemies and to get them back on track spiritually. And so then they would repent and turn back to God and everything would go great for a while and then the cycle would continue. Then they would start to fall off again. And, and turn their back on God. And then they would be attacked. And then God would raise up a judge. And then they would be rescued. And, then, and it just continued like this over and over again. And all these different judges that God used throughout the history of Israel at this time period um, were, are referred to in the book of Judges. And one of those judges, one of these heroes, one of these men that God raises up is a man named Samson. Next slide, please. Samson. Now, when people hear the word Samson, well, how about this? What do you, when you hear the word Samson, what do you think of? What's another word that you think of that you associate with Samson? What's what we're arguing with? Strength. What else? Hair. Yeah. And I mentioned it to Julia yesterday. She said Delilah was the first thing she thought of. We're going to talk a lot about Delilah, too. Right, so when we think about Samson, the most, the, the, I th- know for me, and probably for most people, the very first thing we think of is strength. He was strong, the strongest man who ever lived. Um, when Samson was born, his parents dedicated him to the Lord with a Nazarite vow. Okay, a Nazarite vow. What is that? Well, in the Old Testament, in the, in the Jewish culture, they would do this thing where they would make a vow to dedicate themselves to the Lord. Similar to a priest or a nun who makes a vow of celibacy to the Lord, um, a Nazarite vow had three elements, certain things that they would commit themselves to be totally dedicated to God. And the three things were, next slide please, no drinking wine or any grape juice, in fact, can't even touch grapes, no touching dead things, and no cutting your hair. Those were the three rules of the Nazarite vow. And the hair thing becomes particularly important in Samson's story. And so all three of these restrictions would remind you that, and others, that you were dedicated to God. Your whole life was dedicated to God. So Samson was a Nazarite. His parents, not a Nazarene, that's something different, that's someone from Nazareth. Jesus was a Nazarene, not a Nazarite. A Nazarite, someone who has taken this Nazarite vow and dedicated themselves to God. Samson was a Nazarite. His parents dedicated him right from birth. And so God raised up Samson as one of these judges. And God empowered Samson from time to time with supernatural, superhuman strength in order to defeat the enemies of Israel. And in this case, that would be the Philistines in this period of time and the location where this was taking place, the Philistines. And so Samson's strength that was given to him was directly tied to his Nazarite vow. Specifically, in some mysterious way that I don't understand, It was tied to the length of his hair. So his hair was long and it was the secret to the strength. As part of this vow, 
The long hair was the secret to his strength. So God indeed empowered Samson on several occasions with this exceptional strength. Now let's just look at some of Samson's highlights, some of the strong man moments of Samson. Um, and these are found in Judges 14, 15, and 16. You go to the next slide? Yeah, perfect. Right there. Okay. He killed a lion with his bare hands, tearing it apart. He killed 30 Philistines in one instance. He killed many more Philistines after burning their fields by attaching torches to the tails of foxes. Yes, very, very strange story. Ties torches to the tails of foxes and sends them out in this field and burns their fields. Another instance, uh, he freed himself from ropes and killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. And the Gaza Gate incident, when he tore down the gigantic, heavy gates of the city of Gaza and then carried it off up a hill to a totally different place. These are just some of Samson's exploits that we have recorded in Scripture. I would love to see Samson in a strong man competition. I think he'd put Dirk Bishop to shame. This guy was incredible. But here's the thing about Samson, okay? He had some issues. He had some major issues. He had sin issues. And as we take a closer look at Samson, we get beyond the Sunday school version of Samson, which we just kind of talked about. We start to look at the real Samson that's recorded in Scripture. We find out that strength, strength, maybe shouldn't be the first word that we associate with the guy. Maybe when we think about Samson, we shouldn't think strong. Maybe we should think weak. Because even though Samson had incredible physical strength, he also had an incredible weakness of character. He was this public figure seen by many as a hero. And indeed, God absolutely used Samson. But the truth about Samson was something far less appealing. And, and it's amazing, by the way, that God, and it's just a testimony to God's grace, that he can use us even when we are failures. And that's good news for all of us. But it's an all too common reality, isn't it, that we can have a public persona, this one side of us that everybody sees, that's so squeaky clean and nice and wonderful and smiley, and then maybe there is another side of us a darker reality that people don't always see. And sometimes um, many people deal with that. Um, for example, this week, you may have heard about a, uh, a former pastor who's working at St. of X now who was, who was uh, charged this week with sexual assault, alleged sexual assault and sexual exploitation of a teenage girl who was part of his church when he was pastoring in Halifax. This is a former classmate of mine from Acadia Divinity College. Okay? He is the third former classmate of mine to be charged with something like this. Okay? And this just absolutely breaks my heart. Absolutely breaks my heart. It breaks my heart for everybody involved, for the victims most of all, of course, but also for the churches that are involved in this. It just destroys their witness. And also for the pastors that are involved in this. Some of these guys I knew well. One was a really close friend. Um, these are guys who obviously wrestled with this kind of double life. Where they've got this public profile, but they have this secret sin. And those two things were in conflict with each other. And the potential for that secret sin... That's within all of us. So we have to be so careful because it, it's, that potential is there in all of us. We all have this sinful nature. And it, and it was in Samson as well. Samson had this life where he was this judge, this man of God, this hero, this Nazarite. And then this other life where he's, well, he's selfish, he's lustful, he abuses women. A rotten guy, really. So we've reviewed the highlight reel of Samson's achievements. Now let's take a turn and look at the ugly side of Samson. Let's look at some of these other parts of his life. These sinful aspects. So, next slide, there we go. Samson disregards the law of God. So it was the part of the Jewish law, you weren't, if you were Jewish, you weren't supposed to marry 
a non-Jew. Samson, nonetheless, he marries a non-Jew. And worse yet, a Philistine girl. The enemy. Why does he do that? It says in Judges 14, because he says, she is right in my eyes. She's right in my eyes. He just looked at her and he thought, yeah, she's hot and I want her. And I don't care what the law of God says. She's the one I want. He just disregards the law of God for his lust, to satisfy his lust. And tied into that, he dishonors women. I mean, think about the woman involved in that situation. She doesn't get a say, he just takes advantage of her. And that's a recurring theme in Samson's life. Samson disrespects his parents. His parents try to discourage him from marrying this Philistine girl. They're like, come on, Samson. Isn't there any beautiful women and available women amongst your own people? And Samson says, she's the one I want. I don't care what you say. He disrespects his parents. He won't listen to them. Samson deserts his vow. He's made this Nazarite vow. No touching anything dead. No drinking alcohol. He's not supposed to cut his hair. Well, guess what? He, does, he breaks all three of those things. He's not supposed to touch any dead thing, but he eats honey out of the carcass of that lion that he had killed. He comes along later and the lion... I think it's gross. I don't know why he did that. But anyway, this dead lion carcass... And there's bees and they've made honey in it. And he reaches in and he eats this honey. He breaks the Nazarite vow. He's not supposed to drink alcohol. But we see him feasting with the Philistines. And the word feasting in the Hebrew there means a feast that involves alcohol. That's what it's always used as this big, you know, drunken feast. And he's not supposed to cut his hair. And we'll see later he allows that to take place too. So he has just totally broken his vows. Samson distorts his purpose. God had called him as a judge to be a killer of Philistines, to be a a hero to rescue Israel from their enemy, the Philistines. Instead, he hangs out with the Philistines. He even marries a Philistine. He's got his purpose confused. Samson defiles his purity. He he abandons this wife that he marries. At one point, he just abandons her. She ends up marrying uh, the best man at his wedding. I know it's a crazy story. And I'll tell you, you think the Bible's boring? Read the book of Judges. Man, there is some crazy stuff in there. And some of it is rated R, by the way. Um, um, uh, so anyway, he abandons his wife. She marries his best man. Later, he goes to Gaza and he sleeps with a prostitute. And then later, he falls in love with another Philistine woman named Delilah. Oh, man, she's a piece of work. And he ends up living with her, unmarried. All of this contrary to the behavior of a man of God. And Samson depletes his power. So he's had this power that God has given him. But by the end of Samson's story, he's living with Delilah and she's playing him like a fool. So much for the strong man that he's supposed to be. A few seductive words and some tears from Delilah and he caves under the pressure. He eventually reveals to her the secret of his power, his hair, the Nazarite vow. While he's sleeping, she cuts off his hair. And the Philistines are finally able to overtake him easily. And it says rather sadly in Judges 16 verse 20. That when Samson awoke to find the Philistines capturing him. It says he did not know that the Lord had left him. I find that so sad. And I come to that part of the story. He didn't know that the Lord had left him. God had left him. Through Samson's story, it starts in Judges 13, goes to Judges 16. Through his story, God is present. We see over and over again, it says that the Spirit came upon Samson and gave him strength to accomplish all these things. And we see that through Judges 13 and 14 and 15. But when we get to Judges 16, guess what? There's no more mention of God or the Spirit in Samson's life anymore. It would seem that God had left Samson even before Delilah cuts his hair. He did not know that the Lord had left him. So Samson is seized by his enemies. They gouge out his eyeballs and they make him their slave. And he ends up, they put him in prison and his job is to turn a millstone. These big, heavy stones that would normally be powered by donkeys or other animals. And he is the one whose job it is to turn this millstone. And so we have this downward spiral 
of sin in Samson's life. He hits rock bottom. His selfishness, his lust, his disregard for the ways of the Lord, they just gradually take their toll on him until he is as low as a person could go. And now he's in chains, walking in circles, literally going nowhere. There's this quote I shared on Facebook this past week. It says, Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Another author said this about Samson. Samson was blind long before his eyes were gouged out. So we look at this and we tisk and we shake our heads. Samson, you naughty, rotten guy. But we are just as guilty of sin and selfishness as Samson ever was. Now maybe we haven't done some of the same things that Samson did. Hopefully you haven't. But nonetheless, we are all guilty. We all need to take a good look at ourselves and see how in many ways we can be just like Samson. Oh, well, I know that I have committed my life to Christ, but I'm just going to continually violate that in the way I live. Oh, I know that the Bible says that God's Word says I'm supposed to live this way, but... But this over here is so appealing. We do the exact same thing as Samson. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, the Bible says. And if we're not careful, we can end up exactly where Samson ended up. The Bible says that sin ultimately leads to death. And so sin has that effect. It just keeps taking you farther and farther. And if you let it, it will just take you along right to the end. We heard it from Mitch DeMerchant a few weeks ago. Once sin gets a hold of your life and you allow it, it will take control of you until you finally hit the bottom like Samson had. But there's hope. There's a turning point in Samson's story. Samson's story takes a turn back toward God. So if you have your Bible, you can turn. This is the scripture we're going to be using this morning, and we're almost done, actually. Judges 16 Verse 22, where we're going to be reading from. So here the scene, Samson is a prisoner. He's grinding in this mill in the prison, walking in circles, doing his thing, day after day. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it was shaved. I love how that's written in this narrative kind of thing. It's like a movie, right? He's like there, but it's like his hair is growing again. Something is changing. And I think that the hair that's growing on his head reflected something that was also happening in his heart. He was beginning to turn back to the Lord because we see in the next scene, sometime later, the Philistines are throwing a big party in honor of their god, Dagon. And they went... They want to put Samson on display. They want to make a mockery of him and be entertained by this blind Jewish former hero who is now their prisoner. And so they bring him out and they mock him. Hey, Samson, ah, look at you. You're so strong, Samson. Right? Maybe he's got his head covered. They don't know his hair is growing back yet. And they put him up. They, they chain him to the pillars of the temple of Dagon. As they are all there, thousands of them gathered. Thousands even on the roof of the temple. And thousands in the temple. It's a huge temple. And they're all there praising this false god. And Samson is chained to the pillars. This is what it says in verse 28. Judges 16. Then Samson called to the Lord. Samson called to the Lord. Maybe for the first time in years. He's praying again. He's calling to the Lord again. He's talking to God again. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, Oh Lord God, please remember me. This is a prayer of 
of repentance. This is a prayer of mercy, crying for mercy to God. Please remember me. And please strengthen me only this once, once, O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested. And he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And then he bowed with all of his strength in the house, fell upon the Lord's, upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he killed during his life. Then his brothers and all his family came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of Manoah his father. And he had judged Israel 20 years. Samson is given a chance at the end to set things right. This is his moment of redemption. In his last act on the earth, he uses the strength that God had restored to him and the opportunity he had found himself with to defeat the enemies of God and God's people. And in doing so, he himself is also killed. And he's listed among the heroes of the faith in Hebrews chapter 11, in the great hall of faith chapter. So think about this. A man who, who lived his life so selfishly for so long died in an act of self-sacrifice to help his nation and bring honor to God. He finally stops thinking about himself for once and he sacrifices his life to the Lord. Okay, so three lessons, three takeaways from this last act of Samson where he says, I want to die with the Philistines. Number one, it's never too late to turn back to God. There's a lot of people out there who have gone down a certain path, a certain lifestyle for so long, they don't think there's any hope they'll ever be able to change. They don't think there's any hope for anything different. They've given up on themselves and they're pretty sure that God has given up on them too. And Samson's life is a reminder that God never gives up on us and it's never too late to turn back to him. Lesson number two, don't let your limitations stop you from serving God. Take hold of whatever opportunity you've been given with whatever resources you have. Samson had a little bit of strength and a couple pillars. That's all he had left. He was blind He was a prisoner, he was in chains, but he took what he had and he took the opportunity of the moment and he did something that has allowed him to go down in history as one of the heroes of the Bible, despite his failures. Not one of the losers of the Bible, one of the heroes. Why? Because of that redemption in in his last act on earth. We all have limitations. We really do. All of us have something that limits us. Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe it's a lack of money. Maybe it's no free time. Maybe it's insecurities that we have. Maybe it's some sort of disability that we have. Whatever it is, all of us have limitations that can hold us back from serving God fully. But the challenge for us is to not allow those limitations to hold us back from serving God fully. Jesus told the story, or yeah, there was a widow who who gave a a little penny or something into the offering at the temple and... and, uh, there were these other people that were giving lots and lots and lots. But Jesus says, said to his disciples, that woman has given more than all these other people that are giving a lot. And they said, well, how is that possible? They said, Jesus said, because she has given everything she has. It's all she had. And she gave it. Not 10%, 100%. Don't let your limitations stop you from serving God. Take hold of whatever opportunities you've been given with whatever resources you have. And imagine, imagine what incredible work for the kingdom of God Jesus still has for you to do and that Jesus could do through you if you're willing. He's not looking for the able. He's looking for the willing. I always love that. I need to hear that. Because sometimes I feel so inadequate, you know? But God is just looking for willing people. He doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. 
He'll give you the strength to do it when the time comes. And the third lesson, self-sacrifice is the way of Jesus. At the end, Samson sacrifices himself to defeat his enemies. This ought to remind us of the way we're supposed to live. Not a self-centered existence where we cater to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life like Samson had for so long, but a life where we are willing to empty ourselves, to give up our lives entirely for the cause of Christ. And Jesus modeled this perfectly, of course. Like Samson, he even sacrificed himself to defeat his enemies. Jesus' death on the cross was an act of war against hell. And Jesus won. It says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. He went to war on the cross. And that's exactly what he did. He destroyed the works of the devil. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, it's talking about him on the cross. And it says, he disarmed the rulers and authorities, that's spiritual rulers and authorities, meaning the, the spiritual authorities of hell, and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. On the cross, Jesus defeated his enemies by sacrificing himself. So Samson in his death is a picture of Christ. Isn't that cool? So here's the last thing. Don't be enslaved to sin like Samson was for so much of his life. Instead, repent of your sin. Turn back to God and take hold of the victory that Jesus has already won for you by his grace through faith. It's never too late until... You take your last breath. Then it's too late. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word today. We're challenged by it, Lord. As we look at the life of Samson, God, we may see things that reflect back at us, ourselves, and our own struggles. Lord, all of us have struggles one way or another with sin. I pray, Father, that you would help us to learn as Samson did, Lord, albeit late in his life, to turn back to you, God, to commit ourselves fully to you, to live a life of of self-sacrifice, and to use whatever we have for your honor and for your glory. Lord, I thank you for um, this church. Lord, I'm so encouraged by this congregation. And I thank you for them. I love them, God, and I pray that you would bless them. In Jesus' name, amen.